Massimo, to talk about astrobiology, a very hot topic, both in uh, the uh, observational sciences with the new James Webb Telescope, as well as, uh, as, well as many other studies. Uh, there are two fundamental questions, two potential uh, transitions or step functions. One is the transition from non-life to life, and the second transition is from life to some kind of intelligent life, um, or some type of sentient life. Uh, what is, as a philosopher of biology, how do you analyze those two uh, fundamental transitions? The question of how frequent life is in the universe, and then the sub-question of how frequent intelligent life is in the universe is one of those things that I changed my mind significantly over the course of my career. I was much more optimistic about both questions when I was younger, <laughs> and I'm significantly on the pessimist side now, more so about intelligent life than, than just life in general. Is that your, your, your biology hat uh, uh, still on, or is that your philosophical hat over, overwhelming your biology hat? You, know, you have it, these two big hats. Yeah, it is, and it's hard to tell. They kind of interact <laughs> with right, each other. All right, all right. Uh, they, hopefully, they inform each other <laughs> rather than, than interfering with each other. So here's the thing. First of all, of course, this whole uh, debate hinges significantly on what we mean by life and what we mean by intelligence. Okay. And as you know, those are difficult questions to begin with. But let's assume that we have some kind of uh, general sense of what we mean by those, by those terms, based, of course, on what? On the only experience of life and intelligence that we have right here on Earth. A single data point. Correct. It's a single data point. Now, one of the fundamental uh, pieces of theory underlying the whole SETI project, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is the famous Drake equation, which is bad news because it was proposed in the 1950s. Um, in, the, in terms of history of science, when a field is essentially theoretically stuck <laughs> in the seven years early, earlier, <laughs> uh, it's not good news. It means that not a lot of progress has actually been made, been made. And of course, why has no progress been made on the question? Because we still have a data point of n equal one. We haven't discovered. Yeah, arguably, there has been progress in one of the terms that dealt with the the, the number of uh, uh, habitable planets. Correct. Because since that time, we've learned we didn't we didn't know if they you know if if, if stars had um, uh, planetary systems, whether that was one in a trillion or one in two. And now we know that there seems to be at least as many planets as there are stars and maybe more. Right. So, so that one term, we, we've, we've made some progress. That is on. correct. And we've actually also made progress on a couple of other terms of the Drake equation that have to do with the uh, frequency of formation of stars, for instance, you know, okay. things like that. Okay. Unfortunately, those are the easy ones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> right? uh, it, things get really complicated when we get to fundamental uh, aspects of the Drake equation that have to do with, let's say, how frequent is life on planets that have at least the physical characteristics that appear to be yeah. uh, conducive to life? Liquid, well, we don't know. liquid water. Yeah. Right, liquid yeah. water and things like that. Well, we don't know. We, don't we know. really That's have true. no idea, right? Yeah. Once life has emerged, what is the chance? What are the chances that actually it gets so complicated to generate intelligence, the kind of intelligence that produces technology? We have absolutely no idea. If it does, how long does that kind of of civilization last, you know, does it last long enough that we actually have a chance to perceive, you know, uh, signals that are generated by such an intelligence? Again, we have no idea. We just don't, we only have not even a, a single data point in that case. But when it comes to, <laughs> we right, don't even know our own case. We're exactly, because we're still alive. Yeah. Our, yeah. our uh, civilization is still around, and, so we don't know. And maybe we, we, we have broadcast accidentally, you know, 60, 70 years of I Love Lucy or something. And so <laughs> you, you couldn't even, you see a, 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 a picture of the Milky Way, you couldn't even see how far that went at the speed of light. Exactly. It's very small. So the bottom line is uh, there is an incredible amount of uncertainty there. And especially when it gets to the more interesting questions. I think that because, because we do know that life on Earth originated fairly quickly, after the physical, yeah, geophysical right. situation sort of settled down in a, in a way, in a set of, you know, in a range of parameters that was conducive to life. So that happened very quickly. That's so that's good news, that's right? Interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, that is interesting and it's good news. That's good news if you want to find somebody. It's bad news if you don't. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and so that would suggest that 
although we still don't actually have a number that we can plug into the Drake equation, that number might be significantly high. But mm -hmm. after that, uh, any guess you know, yeah. is, is just as good as any other sure. guess. That's part of the problem. The other problem is that if you think about it, the, SETI, the entire SETI project, it's really based on a narcissistic assumption. That is that alien life, intelligent life out there, it's pretty much like us. That, that these, these beings are psychologically like us, they're curious, they want to communicate, they wanna, they're interested in technology. These are all things that are essentially human. Well, what's not human is the electromagnetic spectrum. I mean, that True. exists for everyone. Any sort of intelligence through any mechanism, and, and we call it intelligent, they would be able to access that. In some, in some way. They may not have our desire to learn or do it. But the, the problem I have is that when you say they, you, you're, we're homogenizing uh, enormous numbers, trillions and trillions of possible situations. And it, it's really not, not a they. It's, it's, it, it's, it's uh, innumerable numbers of, of, of dis distinguished, individual distinguished uh, civilizations potentially. So there should right. be there should be a, an, a, an exploration of every possibility. It should explore every possibility within right. those numbers. But you just pointed out a major problem, right? For, yes, you're absolutely right. They means actually potentially a almost infinite plurality of right. ways of becoming intelligent, technological, right. et cetera, et cetera. And we have no guiding principle. Uh, when, when we say, you know, we should explore all of them, all of what? We, there's too much. We don't have a, we need some kind of principle to narrow it down. We need some kind of, of room by which we can actually guide, it, guide ourselves into the discovery of these, of these uh, beings. And we don't have it. The only ones that we have is, well, let's assume that they are pretty much like us. Uh, yeah. In that sense, I, I meant to say, you know, it's a fairly narcissistic, human-centered uh, yeah, e either they have to do something electromagnetic or some with some physical manipulation and some object. Sure. You know, the 2001 uh, monolith the or monolith. something. That's something. Right. Something. <laughs> something. That's right. But then, the, then there is, as you know, another issue, which I did not take seriously enough when I was younger, mm. and it now worries me increasingly, and that is uh, the Fermi paradox. Uh, so famously, uh, Enrico Fermi yeah, I love that, yeah. at one point said, you know, if there are all these... Yeah. civilizations out there, what the hell are they? Yeah. Uh, why have we not actually encountered them, either physically encountered them, uh, you know, an actual visit, uh, or at least electromagnetically encountered? Yeah. A lot of people dismiss of... the Fermi paradox. There are books written that here are the 50 explanations. Right. But uh, and, and it, I read it, those books, yeah, and I, I don't I, find I, any of those particularly compelling. And, and, and I, I, I would phrase it exactly the opposite, but can't come to the same conclusion. I said, I find them all compelling, <laughs> but there only has to be one or two exceptions to any of them, right. given 10, 20 million years, which is an eye blink in universal history, and, and the artifacts that that civilization would make would become obvious. It would fill, it would fill a, gal a galaxy. So in my mind, the bottom line is that the, SETI, the entire SETI project is based on a sample size of zero in terms of mm -hmm. you know, actual, dis actual uh, findings, which is kind of interesting because we've been spending literally decades and a significant amount of you know dollars and uh, and uh, time of scientists and so on and so forth trying to do something that we really have not much guidance for, nor we, do we have a reasonable assessment of the probability of success. Of course, all of this could change tomorrow. Right? We could <laughs> wake up tomorrow morning <laughs> and the, the the first page of the front page of the New York Times says. Aliens discovered, yeah. and then now everything that we just said right. goes out the window. But that has not happened for several decades, and there is no reason to think that might that might actually happen uh, in the immediate or even the long the long distant future. We just don't know. It's one of those uh, situations where the uh, theory is so underdetermined by the data, as philosophers mm -hmm. like to put it, that it's not even funny.